As we get into the text this morning, I want to ask you a question, and here it is. How would you summarize the basic message of Christianity in only three words? If someone said to you, hey, summarize for me what Christians believe in just a short sentence, how would you do that? Here's how the two most influential apostles in the New Testament answered that question. First of all, the Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And then the Apostle Peter in the book of Acts chapter 10 summarizes the gospel message as good news of peace Through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. So both Paul and Peter summarize the essence of the Christian message this way. Jesus is Lord. What a provocative message. What a confrontational message. It's this message and its implications that have gotten the Apostle Paul in trouble in almost every city in the Roman Empire. And it's this message that today will get him arrested in the city of Jerusalem. This morning, we reach a turning point in the book of Acts. Here in chapter 21, Paul is arrested, and for the rest of the book, we're going to basically see Paul on trial five different times. All right, so... Paul's missionary journeys are over. His travels throughout the Roman Empire, planting churches are over. Now you're going to feel a bit like you're watching the same movie five different times. All right. So on five different occasions before five different sets of authority figures between Acts 21 and the end of the book, we're going to hear the Apostle Paul say, here's who I am, here's what I've been doing, and here's the message I've been preaching. And that message boils down to this. Jesus is Lord. And what we see throughout the book of Acts, what we have seen and what we continue to see even this morning is that there are only two possible responses to that proclamation, to that message. The two responses are this, humility and hostility. Those are the only two ways of responding to the proclamation that Jesus is Lord, humility or hostility. And Luke is intentionally pressing that contrast. He wants you to see that you can't remain neutral. Either Jesus is Lord or he isn't, but you don't get to stay on the sidelines. You have to do something with that proclamation. It forces upon you a decision. And here in Acts 21, we see these two responses. We see some who respond in humility and some who respond in hostility to the proclamation that Jesus is Lord. And so I want to examine the contours of these two responses. As we sort of turn this corner in Acts and get set up now for Paul, defending his ministry and his message before various sets of authority, I want to examine these two responses to the message that Jesus is Lord. The response of humility and the response of hostility. Let's take a closer look at at how these play out. And so if you have a Bible, go to Acts 21, which we already heard read. This is where we're going to dwell this morning as we continue to engage the book of Acts together. The first people we meet in this chapter are some, a number of different people, who have responded in humility to the proclamation that Jesus is Lord. They've bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus. They are disciples, followers of Jesus. And it's interesting as we look at this And as we look at this chapter, that it shows us the shape or the contours of humility. It shows us what humility looks like. So let's observe what we see, what we learn about a humble response to the message of Jesus as Lord. Uh, First of all, I want you to notice that humility looks like hospitality hospitality. Notice that Paul and his companions are traveling. This picks up where we left off last week. They're on a voyage coming back from Asia to Jerusalem. And so we pick up again in the middle of these travels. And if we pick up the story in the middle of verse 3 in chapter 21, we see this. Um, 
We sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And then in verse 8, it says, We departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. And then later on in verse 15, after these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem, and some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. And notice the hospitality of the Christians in these three different cities. Notice that as Paul describes his journeys, he says that we went and stayed with these folks, and then we found some disciples in this city and stayed with them. This is an expression, a manifestation of what humility looks like when it's lived out. It looks like hospitality. See, pride says, this is my stuff, I earned it, and I'll do what I want with it. But see, if Jesus is Lord, and if I've humbled myself under His Lordship, then I realize the stuff I have, my house, my assets, my food, the things at my disposal, these things aren't mine, they belong to Him. And so out of humility, I I willingly share those things. I'm I'm hospitable and generous with what the Lord has given me. Why? Because it's His anyway. He's Lord. It's not my stuff. Humility looks like hospitality. And by the way, I want to at this point just honor and thank uh, some of you in this room that practice this Every single week, and I'm speaking particularly of those of you in the room who host a gospel community in your home, right? Cormdale has 40 different gospel communities that gather throughout the city, and they mostly gather in people's living rooms and people's houses and people's kitchens and people's basements and people's wherever they have room in their house, because some of these missional communities, these gospel communities get rather large. So how many of you host a gospel community in your house? Can I just see your hands? It's okay. Put your hands up. We're great. I want you to know. I'm thankful to you for your hospitality. Uh, I know it costs you something, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, It's not like you've never had anything spilled on your kitchen floor. It's not like nobody's ever dropped a piece of silverware down the garbage disposal. It's not like no kid has ever made a mess in your dining room. Okay, so this is costly, but it's it's an expression of humility. Thank you for your hospitality. Humility looks like hospitality. We see it right here in the text. Uh, Notice the second contour or feature of of a humble response to Jesus' lordship. Uh, Humility looks like listening. Listening. Pick up the story with me in verse 10. A prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Do you notice the give and take here? Do you notice the careful listening and discerning to what God is saying and what God's people are saying? Pride says, I want to talk. I want to be heard. I want to make my point of view known. But but if Jesus is Lord, then we recognize what He says matters most. How we respond to what He says matters most. And so notice what you have here. You have a prophet, Agabus, coming down and and delivering prophecy, saying, hey, here's what's going to happen to Paul. He's going to get bound in Jerusalem. And in response to that, there are two sort of responses among the people. Luke and and some of his friends are like, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. But Paul says, hey, that's okay. Okay. I realize that's going to happen, and I'm I'm compelled to go. And so there's agreement on the word and disagreement on what that word should require of Paul. And it says at the end, realizing that, hey, Paul's not dissuaded. He's going to Jerusalem. We ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. 
Uh, Notice this sort of careful dialogue and give and take and back and forth and attentiveness to what God is saying to His people through this Word. Humility looks like listening to the Word of God and to the voice of God through others. When we're convinced that Jesus is Lord, we're more interested in listening than speaking. We're more interested in hearing than making our opinions known. Notice also that humility looks like celebration. Notice verse 17. Paul's on his way to Jerusalem. He finally gets there. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, They glorified God. Pride, friends, is always comparative. I can't celebrate what God is doing through you because I'm too busy comparing it to what he's doing through me. But if Jesus is Lord, then whatever he's doing in the world is worthy of celebration. Right? And remember, what's happened here... James and the the elders in Jerusalem are primarily concerned with the ministry to the Jews in Jerusalem. This is where the movement uh, of Christianity started. There's a lot that they're responsible for. There's a massive church in Jerusalem that they're responsible for. Paul has been commissioned as a missionary to the Gentiles, to the rest of the Roman Empire. And so he comes back and says, hey guys, here's what God's up to. Here's what God's been doing out there in Asia and in Greece and in Macedonia. It says they, they glorify God. They receive that report and say, man, that's awesome. Praise the Lord for what he's doing. They're not going, well, how many people did you have last Sunday? Because we we had a lot here in Jerusalem. You know, they're they're, they're not trying to evaluate, like, how's God working here compared to over there? See, humility doesn't measure our success by how it measures up against somebody else's success. Humility doesn't measure your gospel community against the other one in the neighborhood down the street. Humility says, wherever God's at work, I want to celebrate that. I want to embrace that because Jesus is Lord and he's building his kingdom and he does that in all kinds of different ways through all kinds of different means. Hospitality, listening, celebration. This is the shape that humility takes. This is what we see among these disciples, these Christians who have responded humbly to the news, the message that Jesus is Lord. So so that's the first possible response to the proclamation the news of the gospel humility jesus is lord now now remember well let's get a little sort of ten thousand foot view of what's about to happen here in the text remember the key issue in the book of acts one of the the most important issues is jews versus Gentiles. Remember, there's cultural, social, ethnic, language barriers that create tension and conflict between these two groups of people. And remember, back in Acts chapter 15, they've had a major council in Jerusalem to ask the question, do do the Gentiles who are being converted, do they have to embrace Jewish customs? Do they have to eat like the Jews? And do they have to be circumcised? And do they have to follow all the, the tenets of the ceremonial law that Moses gave? And the answer that the apostles arrived at was no. What they need to do is turn decisively from idolatry. You need to understand that politically at this time in history, the relationship between Jews and Gentiles is a powder keg that's about to explode. Um, th- this text, Acts 21, is taking place in about 57 A.D., In AD 66, nine years after this, the Jews are going to launch an outright armed rebellion against the Roman Empire that is squashed only when Rome sends its army marching into Jerusalem to wage war on the Jews. So this isn't your average like we don't like each other. This is about to erupt in war between two nation states. And so the elders at Jerusalem, though they welcome what, what God's doing among Paul, they, they also recognize this. Paul, there are rumors among the Jewish people that you're rejecting Jewish customs, that you're telling Jewish people out there in Asia and in Greece that, that they don't need to even worry about 
up Moses at all and, and that their customs and the things that have sort of marked them traditionally don't matter. Paul, we know that's not true, but that's the, that's the rumor here in Jerusalem. That's the reputation you've gained because of some people who are spreading lies. And so here's what we want you to do, Paul. There's some of these guys, these Jewish Christians who are about to go through a purification rite. Would you join them in that? Would you go through this sort of ritual so that all the Jews will know that there's nothing to these rumors, that you still do honor the sort of heritage of Jewish um, culture? Paul says, sure, I'm, I'm happy to do that because as we know, again, from the rest of Paul's writings, he says, look, to the Jews, I became like a Jew so I might win the Jews. And to the Gentiles, I became like a Gentile so I could win the Gentiles. I don't, I don't care what cultural clothes I have to wear as long as I get to preach the gospel of Jesus. So, so he's about to go through this purification ritual to sort of quell these rumors in Jerusalem. And as you can see, it actually has the opposite effect. Uh, while he's in the temple finishing this purification rite, he's about to, to be arrested. Notice what happens in verse 27. When the seven days of this particular ritual were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. So we're about to see now, we've seen what humility looks like. We're about to see what hostility looks like. Remember, these people don't have animosity personally toward Paul. They have animosity toward the message that Paul is preaching, that Jesus is Lord, and the implications of that message. They're opposed to Paul because they're opposed to Jesus. And so again, let's look at the contours of hostility. What is it? What does hostility engender? What does it produce? What shape does it take? When we reject the message that Jesus is Lord and therefore look with hostility upon Jesus and his messengers, what shape does it take? First of all, hostility looks like exaggeration. Have you experienced this where you're like, you're hostile to someone and everything they do is sort of exaggerated, right? It's like heightened. It's worse than it actually is. Notice verse 28, what they say. The, these Jews from Asia cry out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere. Okay? I guarantee he's not teaching everyone everywhere. However, this is their language. Everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place, the temple. Okay, now, it's patently not true that Paul's teaching against God's people or against God's law or even against God's temple. So what hostility breeds is an exaggeration, a generalization, a, um, an unwillingness to actually see the contours and understand what someone is doing because I'm just hostile to them. At the end of the day, I don't care. I just want freedom to be opposed. Hostility looks like exaggeration. Secondly, hostility uh, takes the form of assumptions. When, when I'm hostile towards someone, I'm going to assume the worst about them, right? And notice in verse 29. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place, for they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they, what's that word? Supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Okay, they didn't even do their homework. They don't even know that Paul brought him into the temple. They're just like, well, I saw him with that guy in the city, so I'm sure he probably brought him into the temple. Right? Hostility looks like assumption. I'm going to assume the worst about you because I already am skeptical of you, and so I'm just going to assume whatever bad thing you could do, you probably have done. And finally, notice that hostility uh, takes the shape of confusion. Look at verse 30. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut, and as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. Hostility always breeds confusion. We're riled up about something. I'm not sure what, right? This is how mobs work. There's confusion. There's hostility in the air. Something's going on. I don't need to know the facts. Let me just jump in and pile on. 
So the, this Roman centurion takes some soldiers and runs down there, and it says when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Right, so they're, about, they're beating him down until the, the military guards come and, and basically break up the fight. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And then he inquired who he was and what he had done. Let's, hey, let's get this guy in cuffs, and then who, who is this guy, and why are you guys beating him up? Some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another, and he could not learn the facts because of the uproar. There's so much confusion. The centurion who's charged with keeping justice can't even get the facts of what's going on. People are yelling one thing, people are yelling another thing. It's mass confusion and chaos. And friends, this is, this is the shape hostility takes. It always breeds confusion. Exaggeration, assumption, confusion. This is the shape that hostility takes. Some people are going to be opposed to the message that Jesus is Lord. Some people are going to respond in humility. Others are going to respond in hostility. And listen, this is just a good thing to remember in a world where our hope is that people aren't hostile, right? Where we really want the chance to like win people over to the message of the gospel. And, and as a church, you guys are a very winsome people. You do a really good job just winsomely portraying the gospel, but, but this text shows us, hey, some people are always going to be hostile to Jesus. They're hostile to you, not because of you. They're hostile to the message that Jesus is Lord, and that's always going to be the case for some people. The message of Christianity is Jesus is Lord, and there are always two responses to that message, humility and hostility. Now, you might have this question, okay, that seems rather stark. What about undecidedness? What about indifference? What about I haven't yet made up my mind? What about I'm not hostile, but I'm also not a follower of Jesus. I'm sort of just in the middle. Isn't that possible? And I think what the book of, book of Acts shows us is, yes, that is uh, possible temporarily. Like we see this in Acts 17, verse 32. Remember back when Paul is preaching in Athens to the Greeks, he, he gives this great sermon, and, and their response is, um, we want to hear you again concerning this. They say, oh, we're intrigued. We're, we're, not, we're not really buying this Jesus is Lord bit yet, but we want to hear some more about this. So I think it is possible for a time to sort of be processing, to, to be undecided. I've been told that Jesus is Lord, and I'm, I'm weighing that. I'm making up my mind whether I believe that or not. But listen, that's always a temporary response. I can't remain undecided forever. Indecision, indifference always ends up at either humility or hostility. At some point, I've got to reckon, is Jesus Lord or isn't he? So, friends, I'm saying to you, the message of Christianity can be summarized in three words. Jesus is Lord. And there are only two possible responses to that message, humility or hostility. That's the two camps that this message seeks to push us into. And Luke is unapologetically writing the book of Acts, talking about the proclamation of the early church because he wants to force upon you that same decision. Look, Jesus is Lord. What are you going to do with that? And so at this point, having heard this message, you're probably thinking something like this, okay? So you're saying there are two groups of people, the humble and the hostile, and obviously, sort of the, the implication of the text and of the sermon is, well, I should be like the humble people, not the hostile people. And that certainly is the message of this text. Luke is writing to, to persuade us to humble ourselves under the proclamation, the message, Jesus is Lord. So the question isn't, what's the right answer? The question is, okay, what do we do with that? If we are to respond in humility, how do we go about doing that? Because if we walked out of here uh, 
thinking this. Okay, there's humble and hostile, and I want to be humble, so I should go try to be a humble person. Who am I relying on at the end of the day? Myself, right? So I'm already controverting the message that Jesus is Lord. And remember, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, we started the message with this. We preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. So if the point of the sermon and the point of the proclamation and the point of Luke's writing is to awaken humility, what do we need to see in order to actually be humbled? What does it take for us to respond to the message Jesus is Lord with humility? And this is where the gospel controverts our assumptions. You see, what you need to see to respond in humility is you need to see that there's actually only one humble person who's ever lived, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us by nature are hostile to the proclamation that Jesus is Lord. There are not humble people and hostile people. There are hostile people and the Lord Jesus. And once you see that, you begin to see this in a whole new light. Here's what, again, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Colossians, a letter, by the way, that he wrote to one of the churches that he planted in Asia Minor. He says this, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He, Jesus, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. So, you were once hostile and evil, but by his death, Jesus presents you holy and blameless and above reproach. The people in Acts 21, the, the Christians we see throughout the book of Acts, are not humble because they were born that way. They're not humble because they just decided on a Tuesday afternoon to start becoming more humble. They are humble because they've reckoned with their hostility and been brought to their knees by the grace and mercy and love and humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that turns hostility into humility. It's the grace of the Lord Jesus that moves toward hostile people and softens them as they see that despite their hostility, despite their indifference, despite their hatred of any God besides themselves, Jesus went to the cross, died for them while they were still sinners. See, we are humbled by His humility. We're humbled when we see, despite my hostility, Jesus died for me. Despite my hostility, my resentment, my resistance to the message that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord because he gave himself for people who were opposed to him. I mean, you realize the person writing this is the Apostle Paul, right? There was perhaps not a more hostile person in the book of Acts, right? Right? This is a murderer of Christians. He hates the Lord Jesus. He hates the church of Jesus. He hates the gospel of Jesus. He hates the lordship of Jesus. And then what happens? He's humbled as he comes face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ who says, I am Jesus, Paul, whom you are persecuting. Hey, hostile guy, I died for you. I'm the Lord Jesus. I've come to crush your hostility. I've come to soften your soul and your heart by my condescension and my humility for you. Friends, the, the narrative of Paul's own story tells us this doctrine. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ turns hostility into humility. And so as we hear the proclamation, Jesus is Lord, here's what it should engender in us. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Thankfulness that Jesus, in his lordship, did not crush us in our hostility, but rather was crushed for us, that we might be humbled. 
that we might receive the opportunity to repent, to trust in Him, to come underneath His Lordship, to be changed and saved by His mercy and condescension. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ turns hostility into humility. And listen, you're going to continue to see these same two responses as the book of Acts rolls forward. There's always two groups of people, those who humble themselves out of recognition of what Jesus has done, and those who remain hardened in their hostility, unwilling to confront the reality that they are hostile toward God who sent His Son to die for them. And so look, here's the the sort of moment that this presses upon us. Here's the moment that Acts 21 presses upon us. If you're here in the room and you're yet hostile to the Lord Jesus, and, or maybe to his people, maybe you haven't connected the dots that you're actually hostile to Jesus, but if you're hostile to the church, if you're hostile to the message of the gospel, if you're hostile toward the idea that there is a Savior who died for the sins of the world, then you're hostile to Jesus. And so this morning the invitation is this. If you're, if you're in the camp of hostility this morning, hey, welcome to the club. Come and be humbled by the Lord Jesus. Come and join a bunch of other people formerly hostile to Jesus who've been softened and melted by his grace. See, the call isn't, hey, stop being hostile and start becoming humbled. The call is recognize your hostility and and let Jesus soften you. Turn to him for grace and mercy and freedom. And then for those of us who who would say we've responded in humility to the message of Jesus as Lord. We've we've come under his lordship. We've submitted, we've bowed the knee to King Jesus. Here's the question for you. Where in your life are you seeking to avoid the lordship of Jesus Christ? What aspects of your being or character or existence are you seeking to keep Jesus out of? Maybe you're not hostile to the Lord Jesus, but maybe there's areas of your life where you're like, "Uh, Jesus, you're not getting that. I'm in charge of that. That's mine. If if none of you in here struggle with that, then I should probably sit out there and you can come preach. Because I know that in my own soul. So look, the... The, the humility to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ is not a, is not a one-time act. It's not a, it's not a one-and-done kind of a thing. It's an ongoing cultivation of a humble heart that says, Jesus, wherever you need to work, wherever there's a need for more grace to flow into my life, to crush areas of opposition and rebellion and selfishness and sin and brokenness, go. Right? Why, why do we confess our sin out loud every single Sunday morning? Because we recognize we need always to be humbling ourselves before the grace of the Lord Jesus. We need always to be seeking his transforming mercy to get down into the cracks and crevices of our hearts where where we shelter ourselves from the demands of his lordship. So where in your soul and in your heart this morning does Jesus need to go to work? Where is he, Lord, and you're not reckoning with that reality? Friends, the invitation to all of us is to come to the Lord Jesus Christ for fresh grace and mercy. So, so look, just like I said, if you're, if you're hostile, welcome to the club. Be humbled by Jesus. I would say this, if you're holding out on the Lordship of Jesus Christ in some area of your life, welcome, come humble yourself under the Lord Jesus. The answer isn't leave here, go get your act together, figure that out, make yourself better, then come back here and worship Jesus. The answer is you're here for a reason, to worship Jesus. You know what the answer to your lack of humility is? Worship Jesus. Get on your knees this morning, receive his mercy, his grace, and his presence, and his mediation, and his person, and his work, and his spirit flowing more deeply into all the crevices of your soul and your being. Friends, Jesus is Lord. That just is. We either reckon with that or we don't, but it doesn't change reality. 
And the fact that Jesus is Lord means he wants all the grace and all the beauty of his lordship to be reflected in our lives as we more and more fully experience him. So would you come to him in fresh humility this morning? Would you open your soul and your heart to him? Would you respond in humble prayer and faith this morning? Would you be, as the text says, his disciple, a follower, one who comes under his lordship? Let's pray and seek him together. Jesus, we affirm with the apostles that you are Lord of all. Your lordship extends to every square inch of your creation. There's no place we can go to hide from you. As Psalm 139 reminds us, if we go to the highest heights, you are there. And if we make our bed in the depths of Sheol, you are there. There is no place in creation where you are not Lord. But there are places in our hearts where we are avoiding your lordship. There are places in our souls where we'd prefer not to submit to your lordship. There are places in our lives where we think we are better gods and lords than you. So Jesus, remind us once again this morning of the beauty of your mercy. That you humbled yourself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross, for a bunch of people who were hostile to you in the first place. God, it wasn't our humility and our uh, willingness to get on our knees before you you that, that made you come out of heaven and die on the cross. Rather, you died for us while we were yet sinners. So remind us of the beauty of your condescension and your grace. Humble us once again before your mercy. Work in the areas of our souls where we need to experience a greater humility and a greater submission to you as Lord. Bring back out of us faith and obedience and repentance and submission and humility and worship this morning, we pray for your glory. Amen.